Welcome to chapter two of the Cosmic Perspective Lectures. Uh, this is part of Mastering Astronomy, and I am Kurt Messick. I am your host for this, this uh, chapter. Uh, once again, just like with chapter one, the caveat is that the PowerPoints that I could find are from the eighth edition of the book. Uh, I don't think with the regard to this material, uh, there's too much of a change along the way, but again, I invite you if you find something that's out of sync with what's in your textbook, please let me know so I can modify things. Uh, I do have a physical copy of uh, the textbook uh, that, that is the eighth edition, I believe, uh, that, that's here. See, this, this, this doesn't like to, uh, this, this online stuff sometimes likes to blot out uh, the, the book. Uh, this is the eighth edition. I actually have on my shelves in my office, I'm not able to get to my office right now, but I have copies all the way from the, the fifth edition all the way up to the ninth edition uh, that's there. Uh, my, my personal favorite edition was, I believe, the seventh edition, or maybe the sixth edition. Yeah, it was the sixth edition uh, that, 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 that I liked quite a bit because it had a harder cover to it. But really, with regard to what we're doing in Astronomy 101, there's a lot of changes that take place in astronomy, but they take place in edgy areas. Uh, we're not going to suddenly discover a new planet, for example. So there are a lot of things at the level that we're looking at in our class that are going to stay the same because we've been doing astronomy for thousands of years. And that's part of what we'll be looking at today in today's lecture. Uh, so without any further ado, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. I have to relearn this every single time. Uh, so let me see if I can get up here to uh, sh do a slideshow. Thank you, slideshow. And let us play it from the start. There we go, yay. We're going to look for things in the night sky. That's helpful in astronomy. It's not always the night sky, though. You can do solar astronomy. You want to look at the sun, and you can't do that at night. Some things are very, very commonsensical. Uh, so, so when you're dealing with questions in our class and when you're dealing with different kinds of assignments, let common sense rule quite frequently. There's, there's no sun at night, for example, typically, unless you're in a weird spot like the North Pole. But typically, even then, we won't call it night. We might call it midnight because it's 12 midnight, uh, but we typically won't call it night if the sun is still in the sky. We say it's, it's the 24-hour day. Uh, likewise, if the sun doesn't come up, we don't call it day. And that there are places on Earth where that happens as well, the North Pole and the South Pole in particular at different times of year. But if you get used to the patterns, you've mastered a lot about astronomy. Ah, mastering astronomy, see, caught you there. Uh, you'll notice that the sun comes up every day and goes down every day, especially from here in Indiana. Even though we may have clouds blocking it, we know what's happening. The moon goes in a predictable pattern. The stars also, it's less obvious, but they go in a predictable pattern. And we see certain constellations at certain times of year. The ancients would know what time of year it was and what times were coming up by watching the patterns of the constellations change. We can see 2,000 stars, maybe more with the naked eye, depending upon light pollution. There are some areas that have a lot of light pollution. There are some places that don't. If you want to see the Milky Way, this sort of band of clouds of gas and dust and other stars, you need to get away from city lights. And you need to get far away from city lights. Even going into southern Indiana or, or out into central Indiana, away from Bloomington, away from Columbus, away from Spencer or Martinsville or other kinds of things, even small towns will, in fact, have ambient light that sparkles in the atmosphere and keeps the, us from seeing really good observations. And the thing is, big cities like Indianapolis, the light pollution from Indianapolis reaches all the way up to Kokomo and all the way down to Bloomington. That is true. You can actually measure the light with the pr appropriate uh, technology because it bounces off the atmosphere. Uh, so it's not a lot. I mean, when we're, we're not seeing a, a sort of a glow from the distance uh, in, in quite the way that we would if we were, say, only 10 miles away. But in fact, it's measurable there, and then it adds to what's going on here. So if you want to see the Milky Way, you have to get to a dark, dark, dark spot. 
along the way. But trust me, it's there and it's there all the time. It's there all night long. A constellation is a region in the sky. So think about the sky as a big map and you draw county lines on the map. That's what a constellation is. Now, there's more than one definition we could use of constellation, though. See, this is Orion. This is the constellation. I could be, if I'm talking about the constellation Orion, talk about this stick figure here. That would be the hunter Orion, and he's got a sort of a sword, and he's sort of his arm is raised, and he, does, he doesn't seem to have a head or legs. Uh, hard to hunt that way. Uh, but he does have an outline here. But notice this red lining all around it as well. This is also, if I had a star over here where the eye is, if I had a star over here where this dotted line is, those would also be considered part of the constellation Orion because they're within the boundary of Orion. Uh, we have two really bright stars in Orion. We have Rigel, which is a bright blue star, and we have Betelgeuse. Uh, that's the way you pronounce it, Betelgeuse. Uh, there. And if you say that three times, Michael Keaton shows up and subs for my class. But that is a star to pay attention to because it is bright and orange. It's one of the stars, both Rigel and Betelgeuse, stars where you can actually see the color. If you have a good night for viewing, you can actually see the color of those. Most stars are just sort of white, yellowish color, but, but Betelgeuse gives you a hint of red and Rigel gives you a hint of blue. Betelgeuse is the most likely star to explode in your lifetime, so it's good to pay attention to that. Here in the summer, we're not really going to get a view of Orion. It's a winter constellation, and as you can see here, we have what's called the Winter Triangle. We have Sirius, mentioned that in uh, Chapter 1, because it's the closest, brightest star in our, in our sky. Uh, there are closer stars to us, but the big bright star, that's the closest big bright star. And it is, in fact, the brightest star in the sky at night. It's eight light years away. We have Alpha Centauri that's a little over four uh, light years away. We have a couple of others that are between there that are dimmer stars. Uh, but these are three stars, Canis Minor, which means the little dog, Canis Major means the big dog, and Betelgeuse here in the Hunter Orion, they form a winter triangle. So we're going to see these in the winter time. We don't see them so much in the summer. So the brightest star in a constellation may actually be further away than a, 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 a star that's closer to us, because depending upon the brightness of the star itself. If I have a 100 watt bulb here and a 40 watt bulb here, you're going to be able to see the 100 watt bulb is brighter. But if I take the 40 watt bulb and stick it right in your face, it may seem brighter than the 100 watt bulb, which is further away. That uh, applies in space as well because it's three dimensional. They're not just on a flat screen up there along the way. It's helpful for us to think about, though, things being on a screen because everything is so far away as we're measuring things. We don't tend to worry so much just for observation purposes about how far and close they are. We, we treat them as if they're equidistant. We are here on planet Earth. We rotate on our axis. We rotate on around the pole. The pole is the axis. So remember those terms. Axis is the pole, the pole is the axis. Every planet that spins, every star that spins, every everything that spins, spins on its axis. And we have a North Pole and a South Pole. We are tilted, actually, as we're going around the sun, we're tilted to that plane that we go around the sun by 23 and a half degrees. So we call that the angle of the ecliptic. That's a good number to memorize, to keep in your head, 23 and a half degrees. Uh, there. So, so sometimes we're pointed towards the sun, sometimes we're pointed away from the sun as we go around. We don't wobble too much, we all wobble just a little bit, uh, but, but we're, we're always angled at that, that 23 and a half degrees, more or less. We wobble just a little bit there as well. But it's a slow wobble. It's not going to wobble off in your lifetime. Uh, so we have an equator that goes out, but we also have what we call the ecliptic, which is the sun's equator that we're going around along the way. So as we go around the sun, sometimes the sun will actually block some of the stars that are out there. So notice here, 
we have our celestial sphere with the county lines all drawn in, the different constellations. Uh, we have some that are in the north. We have some that are in the south. Fornax, for example, is not one we can see from Indiana. It, it's, it's sort of too far south for us to see. The Phoenix down here is too far south for us to see. The Southern Cross, we won't be able to see from up here. The North Pole has the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. You can't see those from Australia. You can't see those from South Africa. You can't see those from Antarctica. But taken all together, there are 88 official constellations. If you're a, a, a musician, you might remember 88 keys on a piano. 88 official constellations that are out there. And from where we are in Indiana, you can see about two thirds of those. So again, you're not, not going to see the ones that are around the South Pole, but you can see two thirds of them, but not all at the same time, because again, as we go around the sun, what we can see will change. So memorizing the constellations, if you went out once a week and looked at the patterns of the stars and just memorized where one or two of them are just each week, by the end of the year, you will have seen all the ones we can see, and you will have memorized where they all are in the sky. So it's not that hard. I invite you to set your sights to doing that, even sort of keep like a weekly chart or a weekly diary, and, and some of them you'll be able to see all the time. The Big Dipper, you can see every night. The Little Dipper, you can see every night. This one up here, Cassiopeia, you can see every night. But some of them, notice Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, where have you heard those words before? If you look up your horoscope, that's where you've heard those. Those will change depending upon our position around the sun. Our Milky Way galaxy is looking at those spiral arms. Remember in uh, lecture one, we showed pictures of the spiral galaxy. These are the spiral arms from the inside. And we're sort of near the edge of the Milky Way. Uh, so we're looking at it edge on from the inside. That's why it looks a little bit funky. We are about 30,000 light years away from the central bulge. It's good for us to be distant out here. We're sort of in the Orion spur of, of uh, the Sagittarius arm uh, that, that's, that's out here. But one of the things that we, we can see from a distance is there are bright lights, big city off in the galactic center. It's good that we're not there because it's very interesting there. And interesting in astronomy usually means radiation. Uh, so being out here in the rural territory means that we are spared a lot of the convulsions that are happening in the middle there along the way. But we do spin around uh, the galactic plane and we go around quite a bit. But from where we are, wherever you are on the planet, there you are. The local sky always has an altitude. How high up are things? If it's right on the horizon, we say it's at zero. If it's directly overhead, it's at 90. You go from zero to 90. It's sort of like a right angle. And that right angle is everywhere, all the way around us. So the 90 degrees up there is 90 degrees from there, from the east. It's 90 degrees from the west. It's 90 degrees from the north. It's 90 degrees from the south. It's 90 degrees from everywhere. So by the time you get up to the 90 degrees, you're actually going down again the other side. That 90 degrees up there is called the zenith. So the zenith. And wherever you are, that moves with you. If I move over here, my zenith has now moved with me. If I move over here, my zenith has moved with me. So these are always dependent on you. Altitude. And the zenith is always dependent upon where you are. This meridian line here is a line from north to south that goes through the meridian. We have those on our own planet too. We, they go from the North Pole to the South Pole and they go 180 degrees, 90 degrees up and 90 degrees down. Uh, that's where we get our latitudes from. So altitudes, and directions in the sky correspond to what's on our planet as well. The horizon is always 90 degrees from the zenith. So if you just point straight ahead, 90 degrees down, 90 degrees down, that's the horizon. And again, the meridian line goes from north to south. We don't have meridians east to west because we don't have an east pole and a west pole. We do have a north pole and a south pole. If you're looking to measure things in the sky, you can sort of stick your hand up if you just sort of 
put your thumb up. Try this sometime with the moon. Uh, you can just sort of close one eye and put your thumb up. It'll cover the moon. That's roughly half a percent to a percent. You again think 90 uh, degrees there. Uh, that's sort of half a degree to one degree uh, that, that, that's there. If you hold out your fist like this, looking at your fist, that's about 10 degrees. And think about it starting at horizon 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Aha. Uh -huh. So the, the zenith from the horizon is about nine fists all the way up. So, and this works no matter who you are. Again, this is close. Close is good in astronomy along the way. So if I know something is like 40 degrees off of the, the, the zenith, I can start there and go four fists down and say, aha, it's in that area there. That really can help in terms of figuring out where things are in the sky. Remember, basic geometry, a full circle has 360 degrees. So when we're talking about 90 degrees, we go from zero to 90, then 90 back to zero, that's 180. Then under the planet, we've got another 180. So a complete circle around the planet's 100 or 360 degrees. Each degree gets broken into 60 minutes, arc minutes if we're talking about minutes here. And then each minute gets broken into 60 seconds. Where did you think this comes from? See, we've got 60 seconds in a minute, and 60 minutes in a degree. We get our time measurements in a relationship to these or, uh, ge geometric measurements that we have here along the way. Uh, so, so, and these come from the ancient Babylonians, and we've been using them ever since. So if we sort of think about all of these different kinds of things, if we sort of put our finger out and it's one degree, well, if it's going to be one degree, it's going to be 60 minutes, and that each of those 60 minutes will have 60 seconds, so it's going to be 3,600 arc seconds, all in just my little thumb that's there along the way. So when we're looking at things, we can measure an angular size. So angular sizes are going to be like half a degree or however many minutes or however many seconds. Most things in the sky are pretty small along the way, so, so because they're very, very far away. So, so as we measure things, we have an angular size. You're mostly not going to need to do too much of this in this class. So stars rise and set, the sun rises and sets. Why? Largely because our planet is spinning, not because the stars are moving, but because our planet is spinning. Here we have a time-lapse photo. And from this time-lapse photo, we can tell that someone set up a camera and we're facing the pole here. Everything goes around the pole, remember that. And this time-lapse photo was probably left open, they just let, sort of left the lens there, for about two to three hours. The reason why I can say that is if we looked at this and thought of it as a clock, then this is probably about 11 o'clock here, maybe 10.30. This is about two o'clock here. So that's about three, three and a half hours. This arc down here, this looks like it's a little past three. This looks like it's about 6.30, maybe going on seven. So again, three and a half hours. This arc over here looks like it might be at seven o'clock, goes up to maybe 10.30. So again, three and a half hours. If we were to trace all of these really long arcs that are way out here, we would see they also, like this one here, this one looks like it's maybe about 10.30 and goes to about 1.30. Again, about three hours. So it doesn't matter how long the arc is, it's how long it took in the sky. This is actually the Earth rotating. The Earth rotates from west to east. So everything in the sky looks like it's going in the opposite direction. That's why everything rises in the east and sets in the west. The sun rises in the east, the moon rises in the east, the stars rise in the east, the planets rise in the east. They all rise in the east and set in the west because the planet spins on its axis from west to east. But notice in this little graphic here, if you're standing here on the planet, half the sky is blocked from you. I can't see the sky that's on the other side of the planet. Now, as I spin around, I can see the other side. So now if I spin this around, I'm going to be over here and I can see this part of the sky, except there's a portion down here, notice, 
it's completely blocked. Because no matter how the planet spins, if I'm standing up here, that's always going to be blocked. On the other side, though, up here, notice this is always visible. These are called circumpolar areas. They are circling the pole. The Big Dipper and the Little Dipper for us are up here in the circumpolar area. They are North Pole constellations. There are some that are down here in the South Pole constellations we never see from Indiana. Uh, no matter what season it is, we will never see those because of our tilt and because of where we are on the planet. If we go to other parts of the planet, however, we can see other parts of the sky. So again, if we look at this, what are, what are we pointing at here? Well, we know the equator is going to be flat. So it's, it's going to be sort of halfway. Again, if we sort of look at this, here's, here's the celestial equator. It's, it's not going to be where anything's circling around. If we look at the zenith, remember the zenith is directly overhead. It's not here. That picture isn't pointing directly over your head. It's pointing sort of off in the distance that way. That's just through process of elimination tells you is going to be the pole. But again, if you remember, the pole is what everything goes around. That's the pole. That's the North Pole there. So what you can see depends upon where you are on the planet and the time of year, because as the Earth goes around the sun, things change. Where you are on the Earth is latitude and longitude. Latitude is how far north and south you are. Longitude is how far east and west you are. Latitude is determined by the North Pole and the South Pole. If you're north at the North Pole, you're at 90 degrees. If you are at the South Pole, you're at 90 degrees. Well, that's confusing. So we say you're at 90 degrees north, or 90 degrees south. We have zero at the equator, doesn't have to be north or south, but zero is zero. But from there we go zero to 90, all the way to the North Pole, zero to 90, all the way to the South Pole. And then you go up the other side and you're going back to zero. You go down the other side, you're going back to zero. So three times 90 is 360. Ah. But for longitude, that's a little trickier because that's one of these meridian lines. Remember a meridian? goes through the zenith from North Pole to South Pole. So this is going from the North Pole to the South Pole. But we had to make a political decision as to where longitude starts because there's no East Pole and West Pole. So the political decision a long time ago was settled between France and England. And the prime meridian where it starts is in England now because their ships ruled the waves. And the Naval College in Greenwich is where there's a memorial line for the prime meridian. You may have heard of Greenwich Mean Time. That's where our time zones originate. So the sky will vary what you'll see with how far north and south you go, but it won't vary with how far east and west you go. Why? Because we're spinning west to east. So if you don't see something now, just wait for an hour, wait for an hour, wait for an hour. You'll see it if it's east and west. But in terms of north and south, you're going to have half the planet blocking you at some point along the way. So your local sky will be dependent upon how far north and south you are. When we're here in the north, we can use the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper to help us find the North Polar Star. It's called Polaris. Eris is a Latinate term for star, pole, pole star, Polaris. Uh, it is attached to the Little Dipper, sometimes also called the Little Bear, Ursa Minor, uh, that, again, Latin for little bear. You can also look for the big bear, the big dipper, Ursa Major, and the two stars that are here in the bowl are called pointer stars, and they will point towards Polaris. So as the pole, uh, as we spin around the pole, the constellations also move, and you can actually watch that through the night. You can watch it as it will move. You'll have to sort of stop looking and look later and stop looking and look later, but over the course of several hours, you'll notice it moved. And you can follow these pole, uh, sort of, we might even call them pole position uh, stars, these pointer stars, towards Polaris. And you'll notice that it stays pretty much exactly the same. In the south, we don't have a pole star. There is no south Polaris. But there is a constellation called the Southern Cross, and the Southern Cross, as it goes through the sky, 
also points to where the South Pole is. So if you could see the Southern Cross, you have to sort of get down to the equator and beyond uh, to see it, but you could then figure out where the South Pole is along the way. Here's one of the neat things. If you are 50 degrees above the horizon, so on the planet, in, at the equator, you're 50 degrees up, where would Polaris be? Well, Polaris would be five fists up. Aha, uh -huh, there it is, because it's going to be 50 degrees above your horizon. If you're at the North Pole, you're at 90 degrees, and guess where Polaris is? It's at 90 degrees. It's right above you. If you're at the equator, which is at zero degrees, Polaris is right on the horizon it's going to be at zero degrees. But still, everything goes around Polaris. So if you were at the North Pole, looking up at Polaris, everything would seem to go around it like that. If you were at the equator, looking at Polaris, everything would seem to go like that. Things still go around the pole star in that way. So as we go around the sun, as our planet revolves around the sun, the stars in the night sky will change because we're moving to see different parts of the sky. The sun is in the daytime half of the sky, roughly half. Uh, we'll, well, sometimes days are longer, some days they're a little bit shorter. We'll talk more about that later as well. That's also due to our tilt. But notice here, we have uh, like, like here's the sun and here's our planet, say on January 21st, right here. This side of the planet is in daylight. This side of the planet is at night. So if you look in the sky January uh, 21st, one of the things we'll see is Cancer. We'll also be able to see this, Leo. We'll also be able to see this, Gemini. We can see these constellations at night in January. In December, we could see Cancer and Gemini and Taurus in November, we could see Aries and Taurus and Gemini. Uh, so, so all of these different things here. But these other constellations over here on January 21st, we won't be able to see Aquarius. We won't be able to see Pisces. We won't be able to see Cap Capricornus. Why? Because the sun is in the way. That They're up behind the sun, but the sunlight is so bright, it's blotting out all the stars. We would have to wait half a year to get over here to July before we would start seeing these in the nighttime sky. So theoretically, I'm supposed to be a Libra. I was born in October. Notice here in October, the nighttime sky shows us Pisces, Aries, and Taurus. All of these are constellations that are on that ecliptic, on that tilt uh, that's there. But notice what's in the daytime. Here's Libra. That's why people say, oh, what sign are you? They're talking about the sign that the sun is in front of. And of course, nobody claims Ophiuchus over here. There used to be a 13th constellation. There used to be a 13th month in some calendars uh, here. So that's the forgotten one. So when someone asks me my sign, I say my sign is stop. Uh, in the name of love, you know, think it over. Yeah. But when we're thinking about the spin of the planet. We think about it rotating. Just before I was showing you, it was revolving around the sun. Our planet is constantly in motion. We tend to think of days as being 24 hours long. But the truth is, there's more than one day, way to measure a day. If I just took the Earth and spun it around and said, okay, how long does it take to spin around? It takes 23 hours and 56 minutes. It does not take 24 hours to spin around. So why do we say a day is 24 hours? That's because if I'm looking at the sun and saying, okay, that's 12 noon, and I'm spinning around, it takes me 24 hours to get back there. Well, I said it takes 23 hours and 56 minutes to spin around. Yes, it does. But as I, the Earth, am spinning around, I'm also moving. And to get back to where the sun was, it takes me an extra four minutes to get back to where the sun was. So we call that a solar day. That's 24 hours. But in terms of just the actual rotation, that's four minutes shorter along the way. 
takes a little bit of concept to wrap your head around that. Uh, so think about it a little bit. I'll, uh, I'll come back to this a little bit later in the semester. So when we're looking at the stars, we're looking at things in the sky, it's really due to the Earth's motion as to what we can see. The Earth's motion in terms of rotation and the Earth's motion in terms of going around the sun along the way. Our seasons are caused not by the fact that sometimes we're closer to the sun and sometimes we're further away. It is true that we are sometimes closer to the sun and sometimes further away, but that is not why we have seasons. The reason why we're closer and further away sometimes is we don't go around in a perfect circle. We'll talk about that in a couple of chapters here. But when it's summer here, like it is right now, it's winter in Australia. So how can we say, okay, it's like the whole planet's closer or the whole planet's further away. It's because of the tilt. We are tilted and that's what causes seasons. Keep this in mind. The tilt is the reason for the seasons. And that is true for every planet. Every planet that tilts has seasons. Every planet that does not tilt does not have seasons. Jupiter does not tilt. It does not have seasons. Venus does not tilt. It does not have seasons. Although put an asterisk by Venus because we'll come back to that in a, in a later chapter. Mars tilts the way we do, so it has seasons. We tilt, so we have seasons. Saturn tilts, and it has seasons along the way. If we're going around the sun and we are tilted, remember we're tilted 23 and a half degrees. For part of our time here in the northern hemisphere, we're tilted towards the sun. That's going to be summer here, but notice in the south, they're tilted away. They get less sunlight. It's winter there. As we go around the sun, notice over here, we're going to be tilted away from the sun, and therefore we're in darkness more time, notice how the day gets shorter here, then we are going to, in fact, have a winter here. In Australia, they're tilted towards the sun, so they have summer down there. These are called the solstice days. So the winter solstice for us is the summer solstice for them. The summer solstice for us is the winter solstice for them. The longest day of the year in Indiana, which is coming up in just a few weeks, is the shortest day of the year in Australia. The longest day of the year at the North Pole is the shortest day of the year at the South Pole. Although what you can see here is during this time period, it's 24 hours of daylight and it's 24 hours of night. 24 hours a day in the North Pole means 24 hours of night down here. Day and night are opposites. Summer and winter are opposites. That's something to keep in mind. North and South are opposites. That's a key word, opposite. Halfway between, we have what are called the equinoxes. That's when we're sort of tilted like this, not towards the sun or away from the sun, but equidistant. Equinox means equal night. Nox as in nocturnal. That's where we get 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. That's everywhere on the planet. That's in March and that's in September. But when we have our spring equinox again in the south, they have their fall or autumnal equinox because our seasons are shifting in opposite directions. But it's because of the tilt that we have our seasons. So whether or not we have the light that's directly coming on us, like high in the sky, or if it's at an angle low in the sky, that will make a difference towards the heat that's coming off of it. And that's one of the reasons why even when it's 24 hours of daylight at the North Pole or the South Pole, they still stay frozen. The axis tilt causes this change of directness. And we call that an angle of incidence that's happening. But if you were to take a picture, this is a time-lapse picture here, and this structure here is called the analema. Uh, let me see, can I get uh, something to type with? Uh, this doesn't seem to like to let me type here. Let's go back here. Uh, I, 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 wanna, I wanna type this word out because it will be useful at some point. Analema. This figure eight pattern or this sort of sideways uh, 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 infinity symbol is called the analema. If you were to take a, a camera and just set it up for a year, take a picture of the sun outside the window at the same 
time every day or every week, or this is probably taken every two weeks, uh, one of the things you'll see is the sun gets to a certain point high in the sky and a certain point low in the sky. But throughout the year, it's going to change in its position. And you may have in your own house a particular window or a particular spot where a couple of times a year the sun seems to be coming straight in at you, but other times not because then it's gone higher than the window or lower than the window. I had a particular chair in the last house I lived in that for two weeks in the spring and two weeks in the fall, I had to move the chair because the sun coming up would just blare right into the chair. But all the rest of the year it was fine. Uh, so this when the sun's at its lowest point in the sky is going to mean less direct sunlight because the angle is coming at you at a shallower angle. And therefore, you're going to get less heat. Even if you had more hours, you're still getting less heat. In the summer, it's not because we have more hours, but it's because the sun is higher in the sky and we're getting more of a direct beam of the light that's coming off of the sun. And therefore, we have the higher sun, that's the solstice, that's the solstice, and around in here we have the equinox along the way. This is lopsided for a couple of different reasons, but the, the main reason is, we again, we don't go around in a perfect circle around the sun. So we point towards the same direction all year round. We're always pointed towards Polaris in the North Pole. So as we're going around, we're sort of going around like this. We're not going around like this. We're, we're sort of here, and now we're over here, and now we're over here, but we're always pointed in the same direction. So it's sort of like this. It's always pointed in the same direction. It's not going like this. It's always pointed. Polaris is over here. It's always pointed towards Polaris as it's going around the sun. Uh, so summer occurs when you're facing the sun, when your portion is more towards the sun, winter is when it's less. So it's tilt. Remember, the axis tilt is the reason for the seasons. So distance is less of a concern. One of the things that we see uh, in, in terms of the uh, uh, variation, we don't go around in a perfect circle, but it's only about 3%. We're a very, very close to a perfect circle kind of thing. So our tilt is really much more significant than that small variation. On the other hand, Pluto here, uh, Pluto, poor Pluto, dwarf planet Pluto, one of my favorites still. I belong to a Facebook group called When I Was Your Age, Pluto Was a Planet, and that's true. Uh, so so I, I, I was in my Mm, when was it? I think I was actually in my 30s uh, when, when, when Pluto was demoted, unfortunately, uh, uh, along the way. Was I? Yeah, I think I was in my 30s. And uh, so I'm old, sorry. Uh, but, but Pluto is one in, in it, it is much more of a cigar shape kind of orbit. It's, it's probably more of an egg. I shouldn't say cigar shape, but you get the sense it's not a circle. Uh, so when it comes closer to the sun, it heats up a lot, and when it gets further away, it cools down a lot. We sent the New Horizons probe out to Pluto, and we started this, 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 I'll just give you a little bit of an aside here. This is a little bit of a story, and you'll learn that I tend to tell stories in, not, I, they're, they're true stories, they're science stories, uh, but I tend to be a storyteller. To get probes out as far as Pluto is takes years and years and years. To get a probe built takes years and years and years. To get the funding for a probe to be built takes years and years and years. We reached Pluto in the year 2015 with the New Horizons probe. They started planning that in 1988. Think about that. 1988 to 2015. It took 32 years from when they started planning to get out there. But it was important to get out there by 2015 or so because Pluto is the Game of Thrones planet and winter is coming. Pluto takes about 250 years to go around the sun. And it's not because of its tilt as much as it goes way far away from the sun and comes in closer to the sun. That's when it gets winter, and it gets winter on the entire planet, and it gets winter for 150 years. So when I say Game of Thrones, this is it. Winter is coming. 
and winter was starting around 2015 to 2020. And winter is so cold on Pluto. How cold is it? It's so cold that the atmosphere on Pluto can literally freeze and fall to the ground. And if we were ever going to get any sense of the atmosphere of Pluto from a probe, we couldn't wait. We had to go right then, right there, or miss the shot for 150 years. And we got there. We actually had to sacrifice a few other probes. We were going to send something to Europa around uh, uh, Jupiter. We were going to send uh, probes to Uranus and Neptune, perhaps, as well. But we figured that, that this was a once-in-a-lifetime thing for us here on Earth, whereas Europa and Neptune will still be there. Uh, but we're still, it's 2020, we're just now planning the replacement Europa probe that was going to be launched 20 years ago. Uh, but, but, but yeah, this is important. And we'll talk a lot more about Pluto in a later lecture. Trust me, I'm, I'm a Pluto fanatic, so I really love this sort of stuff. So remember key things, summer solstice, longest day of the year, winter solstice, shortest day of the year, sun is highest in the sky, Sun is lowest in the sky. Remember, Sol for Sun. Uh, they are opposite, depending upon whether you're in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. Equinox, equal night, 12 hours of day and night everywhere. And those are the, in the spring and the fall, halfway between our solstices. So we have four seasons. We have four special points as things go around. And you can notice from where you're standing. Remember your zenith up here and your meridian line, you can go out in the summer and notice the sun is higher in the sky than in the winter when it's lower in the sky. You can notice that here in Indiana. You can notice that pretty much everywhere on the planet. The sun moves through the sky depending upon where we are in terms of our rotation or revolution around the sun. When you get up to the Arctic Circle or the Antarctic Circle, uh, when you are in those areas where you get 24 hours of day and 24 hours of night, guess what? This is what it looks like when we are close to summer solstice at the North Pole. This is not actually the North Pole. This is, you can see land masses there. So this picture is probably going to be Greenland. Uh, uh, Iceland isn't quite far enough north for this, although you can go to the tops of some mountains in Iceland and get this effect on the 21st. Last year, I was lucky enough to get to go and to go far enough north on the island and then far enough up in elevation to get this view. I saw the sun in the sky at midnight. It was phenomenal. It really was along the way. But it never sets. It just goes in a circle in the sky because our planet is tilted towards it. So as we're rotating, we're seeing the sun go in this pattern. So it's really, it's really nifty. It's really neat. But here's another thing. As I, as I mentioned before, we're tilted at 23 and a half degrees and we're wobbling just a little bit. We wobble about 26,000 years all the way through a big circle. So 13,000 years from now, we'll be actually pointing in the opposite direction. We won't be pointing at Polaris anymore. We'll be pointing at a star called Vega, which is another really bright star in the sky. And as we shift through this, we will change our pole stars. There will be any number of different pole stars over the course of 26,000 years. And by the end of 26,000 years, we'll be back to Polaris and we'll just keep going and we'll keep going and we'll keep going along the way. As that happens, the seasons will also shift so that by the time we're pointed from Polaris to Vega, by the time we're pointed at Vega, it will be the middle of winter June 21st here in Indiana, and it will be the middle of summer, December 21st here in Indiana. Now that's not going to happen all at once. It's not like one day we're going to boom. It's going to shift very, 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 very slowly along the way. And any individual human lifetime, and in fact, it, it takes thousands of years for anyone to even notice that this is happening. That was one of the things that happened in the history of astronomy. And I may talk about this in, in chapter three or four. I think it's in chapter three, how they first noticed that everything had moved, that shifted. But that's because we're not solid in the middle 
of our planet. So we're sloshing around, we're wobbling a little bit. So this is called precession. This is called precession as, as you're going around. So seasons are caused by the tilt. Uh, we know what's happening based on the altitude of uh, things. And we are tilted at 23 and a half degrees, but this wobbles a little bit over a 26,000 year processional cycle along the way. So when we're looking at the moon, the moon is the one thing that does go around our planet. And notice how far away the moon looks that's, that's here. Uh, the moon is in fact not really close to us. We often see pictures of the earth and the moon side by side. Uh -uh. It's a quarter of a million miles away. Again, just as we don't go around the sun in a perfect circle, the moon doesn't go around us in a perfect circle. It looks closer sometimes, it looks further away sometimes, because it is. When it's closest, we call it a super moon. When it's furthest away, sometimes we call it a mini moon. But as the moon goes around the earth, it gets sh shaded from the sun or by the earth in different ways we get eclipses, but the phases are actually not caused by eclipses. They're caused by the angle that we're looking at it. If the moon is right in front of us and the sun is over here, then this is the side of the moon that's being illuminated. So if, if I were in a room and that was the only light, I would not be able to see the back of my hand because all the light's over here. But by the time the moon's back here, it's getting all the light. And so we're seeing a full moon back here. We're seeing a new moon here. Over here, I'm seeing light on this side, but not on this side, so I'm getting a quarter. When it's over here, I'm seeing light on this side, but not on this side, so I'm getting the other quarter. So as the moon goes around, we're seeing different phases of the moon. The moon itself is not shining. The moon is reflecting light off of the sun. Uh, the moon has an albedo, that's a good word to remember, and we'll talk about it again later. Uh, uh, but the, the, the word albedo is worth remembering, albedo. That's a word for reflectivity. And the albedo of the Earth, for example, is uh, about 25 to 35%. So about 25 to 35% of the light that hits the Earth bounces off. The moon reflects much less than that. The albedo of the moon is closer to 11%. So 11 to 12%. Uh, most of the sunlight, 90, almost 90%, 88%, is absorbed by the moon. Uh, so so we, we don't get that much sunlight. That's why you don't really get moon burns. Uh, you don't get the same light off of the moon, even though it's reflected sunlight uh, that's there. But as the moon goes around, you're standing here on the Earth, you're, you're not going to see this darker area, you're going to see this brighter area. Here you would see a crescent. You can play with this, I think, in the Mastering Astronomy area on your own. And as the moon goes around, when it's over here at midnight, we're going to have a full moon. When it's over here at noon, we have a new moon. We don't see the moon at all when it's over here because this side is facing away from us. Uh, along the way. These are the phases of the moon. It's a 29.5 day cycle. Now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Back here it said something about 27.3 days to go around the moon. What's up with that? Why do we have different numbers? Hold on, we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But when we're looking at the phases of the moon going from new, it grows, we call that waxing reaches full, then it shrinks, we call that waning, and then it starts off with new again, and we can sort of have this as a pattern. This takes almost an entire moon, month, moon. Where do you think that word comes from? There it is. This is one moon, 29 and a half days, so it's not quite 30 days, although not all months, not all moons are 30 days. Some are 28 days, sometimes it's 29 days. Some are 30 days, some are 31 days. That's because the amount of time that takes for the moon to go around the Earth while the Earth is going around the sun, they don't sync up properly in terms of even numbers. So we have to do the best we can. But to go through all of these phases takes 29 and a half days. If you were to go out and see it's 9 a.m., you're looking up at the sky, you're going to see a third 
quarter moon. So what's happening is the moon is moving closer and closer and closer to being a new moon at that point. Uh, so, so when you've got half bright and half dark, we have a first quarter or we have a third quarter. Uh, first quarter is taking you into the night. Third quarter is taking you into the morning. One of the interesting things about the moon is as the moon goes around the Earth, it keeps the same face towards the Earth all the time. So if this is the moon and my head is the Earth, notice we've got this sort of label here. As it's going around, the label moves around and goes around, and then it comes back around here, and the label stays on this side. This label never faces me. If it were to sort of keep going like this around, even if I were to look at it back there, the label is still facing away. So we call that a synchronous rotation. So we only ever see one side of the moon. As it's going around us, it's keeping the other side away. That's not the dark side of the moon, by the way, because when that side is facing away from us during a new moon, it's fully illuminated. All of the moon gets the sunlight at some point during the month. And all of the moon gets darkness at some point during the month. But part of the moon never faces us. It wobbles just a little bit. So a little bit more than 50% will face us. But roughly half the moon is hidden from us. We never ever saw the far side of the moon until the 1960s when we sent probes up to take pictures from the other side and send them back. Now, we have eclipses. We had a great eclipse here a couple of years ago in Indiana, uh, and it was even better if you drove down to Kentucky or went over to Carbondale, Illinois, or a place like that. In the year 2024, April 8th, 2024, 3 p.m., mark your calendar now. We will have here in Bloomington, in fact, throughout most of Indiana, a full eclipse, a total eclipse. It will hit Evansville, it will hit Bedford, it will hit Bloomington, it will hit Indianapolis, it will hit up into Fort Wayne. Sorry people in Gary, sorry people in, in South Bend. It won't quite hit you there, but it's going to be close for you uh, to drive over. It'll be good in Muncie, so you'll see it in Muncie. You'll see it in, in uh, Anderson and Marion. Uh, so so, so there will be places where you can see it. Uh, the moon, when it goes into eclipse, actually will be seen almost everywhere on the planet. That has to do with the size of the Earth and the size of the moon and what kind of shadow they cast along the way. So an eclipse is when one passes in front of the other and causes the shadow to fall on the other. That doesn't happen every month because they wobble just a little as they're going around. But there are two portions of a shadow. Notice the sunlight that's hitting the earth here. We're getting a darker shadow here. We call that the umbra. But we have some light that's being sort of bounced off in a wider angle here. And we'll talk a little bit more about how light works in chapter five. Uh, so, so stay tuned for that. But one of the things you can notice is that if something goes through the, the umbra, that's the darkest area, that's a full eclipse. If it goes through this lighter shaded area, that's a partial eclipse, that's the penumbra. And that's true if we have a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse. Notice here, these are not to scale, so they're, they're sort of wildly off, but the Earth is larger than the Moon, so the Earth casts a much larger shadow. As the Earth is going through here, we can see sometimes it will go through completely the umbra, and that's going to be a total eclipse. Sometimes it might miss the entirety, and that would be no eclipse at all. So most months it actually misses the entire shadow along the way. Now, if we have a total eclipse and it's in the umbra, notice here that we have this reddish color. And I had a student actually ask me today during our Zoom session, why if it's in the umbra, is it red? Well, as light goes through our atmosphere, it is refracted and bounced around. Uh, that's what gives us our blue sky. We'll talk about that later in the semester. That's what gives us red sky at night, red sky in the morning. Uh, because of the way light reacts in our atmosphere. And the same refracting and, and uh, scattering process that happens in our atmosphere, as the light is going past the Earth here, 
some of it just tiny bits are going past the edge of the earth through our atmosphere and out the other side and as that happens it scatters and it scatters the red and that's what gives us the reddish color on our full eclipses here our total eclipses when we've got partial eclipses we may have one that's sort of hitting both inside the umbra and the, the uh, penumbra here. We call that a partial. If it's only in the penumbra, we call that a penumbral. Uh, those are sometimes actually hard to see unless you're really good at observing the moon. You'll notice it's a little bit dimmer, but not a lot. The reason why this isn't reddish is because it's still getting quite a bit of light from the sun, and that's sort of getting, that's overpowering the reddening effect. When we look at a solar eclipse, that happens during a new moon. These only happen, lunar eclipses during full moon. Only, only, only. They can never happen at any other time. Solar eclipses can only happen during a new moon. And when we're looking at what happens there, notice the moon is much smaller, so the shadow is much smaller. In particular, the umbra, the darkness, the darkest portion is much, much smaller. That's why you had to go over to Carbondale or down uh, into Kentucky or somewhere else to see it. It's not large enough to cover much more than a couple of dozen miles across, but the penumbra can cover hundreds of miles. So here in, in Bloomington, we had a penumbra, a penumbral uh, solar eclipse. We had a partial solar eclipse, and we saw part of the sun being covered but we didn't see the full thing being covered along the way. So as we look at a total solar eclipse, you can sort of see the, the moon is sort of covering, 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 and it gets more and more and more until it covers the sun's disk completely. When that happens, we get this brightness effect here, and this is called the solar corona. And corona is a word that means crown. I know everyone's getting used to the word corona now because of coronavirus. That's because that virus, the structure, you may have seen the little golf ball with all the little things on it, those are called crowns. Corona simply means crown. Corona beer is crown beer. Uh, so, so corona here is the crown of the sun. It's actually the, uh, one of the layers of the atmosphere of the sun. And we'll see that again later in the semester. But as the moon moves off, the sun comes back to the way it is. At this point, the sky darkens. We can only see the corona when it's a 100% total eclipse. We can only see solar eclipses during new moon. And again, I don't know why they have these, these little things over here. This is the wrong graphic, so ignore them. Uh, we can have solar eclipses that are partial, total, or one that's called an annular eclipse. An annular eclipse is when the moon is smaller, it's further away, and doesn't quite cover the whole disk, so we get a ring around. We see a ring around, and annulus is a Latin word for ring. The reason why we don't get solar eclipses every single uh, uh, season or every single month is because the moon's orbit wobbles a bit. It's tilted at 5%, so it has to be at right, the right angle, just the right spot. And that happens roughly twice a year. And those are called the nodes. So we only get it when it's full and new. And we only get it when it's at the nodes. So it has to be at those three conditions along the way. So that's your summary. Full moon, new moon has to be at the nodes, which is when it crosses the ecliptic. So that, that same ecliptic that we were talking about before, the Earth's angle, well, the moon has its own angle too as it's going around. So we can predict the incidence of upcoming solar eclipses because it follows a pattern. It's a convoluted pattern, but it's called a Saros cycle. And eclipses will recur, again, because we have that 29.5 days and that 27.3 day kind of a, a thing about the months, the moons. As, as we go around the sun in 365 and a quarter days, which throws everything off as well, you can see where different patterns will be. We can get some really big eclipses areas happening in our polar regions. Here's the one we had a few years ago, August 21st. Here's the one coming up. Notice we've got this crossing here. 
the reason why one looks like it's this way and one looks like it's that way is because again in August we're tilted one way towards the sun and then in April we're tilted away from it in a different direction. But notice this crossing here, that's Carbondale, Illinois. They get it twice. That's incredibly rare for that to happen. And they get it twice in one lifetime. They get it twice in seven years. Uh, notice we have another one down here in 2031. that's gonna hit the Panama Canal, it looks like. We had one just last year around Chile and Argentina. Uh, there were a lot of people who do tourism kinds of things. There's one taking place again in Chile and Argentina in December of this year. Uh, we've got a number of them that are going to be crossing Australia and New Zealand coming up as well. Uh, so there are quite a number of the, the, the solar eclipses that happen, and there will always be a lunar eclipse in the same month as a solar eclipse. But of course, you can see that from most of the planet whenever that happens along the way. So when we're looking at the planets, and there's one thing I, 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 I want to highlight before we go on to this next one here, because I mentioned it and then I didn't see a slide that got back to it. So, hey, what's the thing with 27.3 uh, days here and 29.5 days here? Uh, so, so we have what's called a synodic month and a sidereal month. And one of them is shorter, one of them is longer. A uh, sidereal month means relative to the stars. As the moon goes around the earth, it takes 27.3 days. But the earth is moving around the sun while the moon is going around the earth. So as the sun continues to move around, or as the earth continues to move around the sun, I hope I'm saying this right, I know what I mean in my head, as the earth remember, <laughs> As the Earth continues to move around the Sun, the Moon moves around the Earth. And because of that, to get back to where the Sun is, which is what causes our phases, it takes a little more than two extra days. Just like when we were talking about that solar day versus our shorter day that goes when just with the axis, well, that's because we're only going about 1% around the, the revolution of the sun. It only takes four extra minutes to catch up to a solar day. The moon moves much slower than that, so it takes more than two more days to catch up with where the sun is. That's where the phases come from. So we have two different ways of defining what the moon is, or the month is, the moons, the months. When we're looking at what the ancients saw, they could see Mercury and Venus Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter. They could not see Uranus and Neptune. Possibly they might have seen, a couple of them might have seen Uranus, but they didn't know it was a planet. They didn't notice it moving anywhere. That was the thing. All of these things move through the sky. The sun moves, the moon moves, all four, five of these planets move, which means one day it might be close to the constellation Aries, Weeks later, months later, it might be close to the constellation Pisces. They are moving, and they're all moving in those constellations. That's another reason why the ancients thought of those as special constellations along the way. They recognize that these are wanderers, and the word planet actually comes from a Greek term meaning wanderer. Uh, so there were seven of them. Yes, how many weeks or days we have in a week? We have a day of the sun, that's a wanderer. We have a day of the moon, Monday, moon day. We have a day of uh, Mars, Mardi Gras, Tuesday. So sometimes we, we take other names from other cultures. Uh, so, so if we take Jupiter, Woden's Day, which is, which is another king of the gods kind of thing. So we have Wednesday that's there. We have Saturn, Saturday. We, we, all of these uh, are, do, do apply. We have Thor's Day, Thursday along the way. As we're watching these planets move through the sky, and so sort of it's in Pisces, and then it's there, and then it's there, and then it's there. Sometimes it would seem to go backwards. We call that apparent retrograde motion. It seems to go backwards across the sky, and then it goes forwards again. Well, that's pretty easy to explain if the sun is in the center. Because as we're going around, see the sun's in the center here in this graphic, as we're going around the sun on the earth, 
we're going faster than Mars. The closer you are into the sun, the faster you go. Mercury takes 88 days. Pluto, way out there, takes 250 years. So the closer you are in, the faster you go. And we'll talk about why later in, in, in the semester. But uh, the ancients realized this too. Jupiter is actually pretty slow. Saturn's even slower as, as they go along. They're further, further out and further away. But as we go around here, if we're standing on Earth, we would see Mars in Gemini. By here, we'd see Mars in Cancer. By here, we would see it edging towards Leo. But notice here, we're lapping. We're lapping Mars. And Mars seems to be backpedaling into Cancer. And here it seems to be going further back into Cancer until we get here and it's catching up around the curve with us. And now it's gone back into Leo and now it's into Leo again and it continues on its way. All of that makes sense. I mean, you can think about it, say you're watching an IndyCar race or a NASCAR race and you're there watching the dash cam. And as you're watching the dash cam, there are cars on either side of your car that you're watching, and some of them seem to be going backwards. Are they going backwards? No, no, they didn't suddenly shove it into reverse and start going backwards. The car you're watching is just going faster, and it looks like they're going backwards. That's retrograde motion too, but it's apparent retrograde motion because it's not real. The planets didn't really go backwards. But the problem is the ancients thought the Earth was in the middle not the sun. Some ancient people, there was a guy named Aristarchus of Samos who came up with the idea of the sun being in the middle, but there were too many people who were philosophical, philosophically and religiously opposed to the idea that the earth couldn't be anything but the center. We have to be the middle of the universe. So in fact, they left that idea off and said, nope, nope, we're not even going to consider it. One of the reasons why they rejected it actually has to do with some real science. If we're going around the sun, we would be going way over here in space and then way over here in space. And when you move around, you get something that's called parallax. And I want you to try this trick with me right now, here where you are, somewhere in, in your room. Uh, look away from the screen, because I want it to be a little bit further away. So if you're looking outside, if you can look outside a window, at something outside, look outside at that. If you're just in, in a room somewhere, look at a painting on the wall or a poster on the wall or something. Now look at that thing and close one eye. And now as you're looking at it and closing one eye, cover what you're looking at with your thumb. Hold your, hold your thumb out and, and cover what you're looking at. Now close that eye and open the other eye. If you do that, you'll notice it jumps. The thing jumps because your two eyes are separated, what I could do is I could measure the distance between your two eyes and the angle, the amount of jump that's there, and I could tell you how far away that thing is from you. That's not actually that hard to do. That's what ancient people used to do to figure out how far across a river they needed to build a bridge. If you need to chop down trees for logs to make something, how many logs do you need? Well, you do the parallax trick. You aim at a tree across the way. You close one eye, you cover that tree, you open one eye, it jumps. You figure out how far away things are. They actually had other measuring devices so you could get a little more precise there. But that's what parallax is. If we're going around the sun, let my head be the sun here for a moment, half the year the Earth will be over here and half the year it will be over here. So I should be able to look at stars with this eye and look at stars with this eye, and then against the other stars that are out there, see it jump. That's parallax. And as we know, they didn't know how far the Earth was from the sun, but as we know, it's 93 million miles. So between the two eyes, we're 93 million miles times two. We're 186 million miles between the two eyes. Guess what? Stars don't jump. They don't jump in parallax. Even the nearby stars don't do it. Why? Because the further away something is, and you can try this experiment at home, the further away it is, the less things jump. And stars are actually too far away to jump to naked eye parallaxing, even if 
we're on opposite sides of the sun. Well, no one wanted to think of the universe being that big, so they just rejected it all together. So the Greeks knew there was no parallax, and they decided that, okay, well, the Earth is in the center and everything's spinning around us. And that became both a tenant of philosophy and for some, a tenant of religion. And thus, they didn't know how to explain the retrograde motion. Uh, they had to come up with inventive ways to do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in an upcoming lecture with Ptolemy. My last story for you is, and you can Google this, I hope you will Google this because it's interesting. How many of you know what your astrological sign is, whether you're a Libra or a Taurus or a Gemini or whatever? Guess what? You're wrong. I don't even know you, and I know you're wrong. You know why? Because that thing I was talking about earlier called precession, where we're pointed at Polaris at 23 and a half degrees, and we wobble over the course of 26,000 years, well, the things that were written down about where your horoscopes should be based on where the stars should be were written down more than 3,000 years ago. Guess what? That we have wobbled more than 10% through the sky since those things were written down. We've wobbled more than an entire astrological sign since those things were written down. And no one's ever updated them because astrology isn't a science in the way that astronomy is a science. So go and Google this and Google whether or not your astrological sign has shifted due to precession. And you'll find some really interesting stuff out there, I promise you that. And in fact, I may even offer this sometime later in, in uh, 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 an extra credit question or something like that. What is your old astrology sign? And what is your actual astrology sign based on where the stars are today? It's an interesting thing. The stars aren't moving in the way that we're moving, but everything, in fact, in the universe is in motion. The stars actually do have some motion. It's called proper motion, but they, again, are so far away, they don't have parallax, that we don't really notice that motion, even over the course of many, many lifetimes. It took us many, many, many lifetimes to even notice there was even the slightest of motions going around. It takes usually thousands, if not tens of thousands of years for anything to happen. And like the Big Dipper, each of the stars in it is moving, but it'll take hundreds of thousands of years before the Big Dipper will lose its shape because of the things that have moved. The Little Dipper is actually moving a little bit faster. That'll take maybe 50 to 100,000 years. But still, that's a long time away, so it's easy to miss that kind of motion. But the astrology signs, they have shifted faster because we've been more than along the way 10%. If we have gone 10% or more along the way, there are only 12 months in the year. We've gone more than a month, so we're out of kilter. I'll see you next time.